All right, in this episode, uh, the great Ice Cube. Um, first of all, I'll start by saying in the middle of the episode, we had a surprise guest. Yes. Which we're not going to spoil for our yes. listeners, but you, you'll be excited. What's been fascinating about Ice Cube, first of all, he's synonymous with cool. I mean, Ice Cube, Cube, they call him Cube, right? Yep. But, you know, married for 28 years, uh, he's had a gazillion different careers, reinventions. He has a PhD in pivoting, mm-hmm. and he's been successful in so many different silos, so humble. But after interviewing him and having this great conversation you and I had, I now know why he is so successful. Yes, absolutely. He is. I don't know if Ice Cube drinks, but he's definitely on uh, the top of my list for guys I'd like to have a beer with. Absolutely. A President A beer. Again, nailed Love you it. again with it. Uh, <laughs> President A beer is the corp uh, sponsor. We love President A beer. A Rod's been drinking President A beer all summer long. If you are enjoying your summer, last couple weeks of summer, make sure that you get a nice, cold, refreshing President Day beer. A Rod uh, is the uh, President Day chairman. You know that it's his go to beer, and you need to check it out. Maybe it's not even uh, summer anymore. Maybe you're listening to this and it's already fall. It's already football season. President Day beer. Boom. We're actually going to have, I want to have you come to the gambling cave this fall and watch a Sunday slate of games, and we'll have some Presidente beers. I will bring buckets of Presidente beer. I love it. I love it. So we're going to do that. Um, And we have a special giveaway for lucky fans, some amazing prizes, Presidente beer for a year, a signed baseball by uh, myself and A-Rod, Presidente swag and the Corp swag, and here's what you have to do to enter. You must be 21 plus, and you must be following at A-Rod, at A-Rod Corp, and at Presidente underscore USA on social media and must text your name and why you should win to Alex's personal phone number 305-690-0485. The beer is 100% corp certified and approved and we love our present day beer. So Ice Cube, we taped Ice Cube. I think it was mid-April. It was on Zoom. It was before um, uh, George Floyd and a lot of the protests that swept across the country. So that's why that was not mentioned in this episode, just to give people a little background. But yes, an unbelievable career. The fact that he has been able to do so much um, for so long is so incredibly rare and admirable. I I just think about all the time about how people have careers that, uh, you know, if if it lasts five, ten years, they're like, that's a success. Ice Cube's been doing it for like three, four decades, and now he's got the big three and movies, and he just keeps finding ways to push the envelope and then reinvent himself and find new ways to create. Yeah, it's hard to be great at everything. Music, movies, now business, and just a great leader in his community. Yes, and we talked about his leadership style, <laughs> what he looks for in uh, people on his team now that he's running the big three. Um, really cool insight into the business side of Ice Cube, what makes him tick and how he stays successful. Uh, before we get to Ice Cube, a quick word from our friends at Simply Safe. You need the best in home security. You need Simply Safe. Most trap you with high prices, tricky contracts, and lousy customer support. So while there are a lot of options out there, there's only one no-brainer. Simply Safe. A Rod needs Simply Safe. I need Simply Safe. A Rod, this whole entire podcast started because I I kind of stalked you on Twitter. Simply Safe would have shut that down. So Simply <laughs> Safe is the best in home security. Simply Safe's got everything you need to protect your home with none of the drawbacks of traditional home security. It's got an arsenal of sensors and cameras to blanket every room, window, and door tailored specifically for your home. Professional monitoring keeps watch day and night ready to send police, fire, or medical professionals if there's an emergency. And you can set it up yourself in under an hour. Just peel and stick the sensors exactly where you need them. No technician required. No contract. No pushy sales guy. No hidden fees. No fine print. All of this starts at just $15 a month. And I'm not the only one who thinks Simply Safe is great. U.S. News and World Report named it the best overall home security of 2020. Try Simply Safe today at simplysafe.com slash corp. You get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. There's nothing to lose. That's simplysafe.com slash corp. And now Ice Cube. You're listening to The Corp, presented by Barstool Sports. Okay, we now welcome on a very special guest to the Corp podcast. It is Ice Cube, who uh, has done a million different things. We'll get into all of them. But first of all, uh, thank you for joining us. And I wanted to start with the big three. 
because it's not often that we get to talk to someone who's actually in the decision-making uh, role for a sports league in the coronavirus world. So I know I saw you guys have delayed it a little bit. What's, what's the status and also what's the thought process on when we can get sports back and get the big three back and rolling? Well, I mean, you know, we wish we could go tomorrow, um, but we can't move faster than the government. Um, it's, or the networks, you know, a couple of networks that, you know, we, we wanted to, to do this show, which is, you know, more or less a reality slash, um, you know, big brother meets big three um, show to try to bring sports back real fast. And, um, you know, the networks is like, it's, it's no way we can put that show on, you know, anytime soon. So it's an issue where we're on one hand trying to pull the, pull the networks and we're trying to, to, you know, adhere to what the government is doing and, you know, abide by all the restrictions. So it's tough. You know, we're still trying to figure out exactly when everything is going to open up. You know, we're kind of in a holding pattern, but, but we're kind of cocked and ready to go as soon as somebody give us the word. Keep so... I want to follow up, Kat, on that, and because and, and, it's such an interesting, I'm such a big fan of the big three. Um, kind of walk me through how you guys came up with this great concept. I mean, the idea of, like, we're getting older now, so running full court, big cat is young, he can do it, but half court is great. Um, how did you guys come up with this concept? Well, it's kind of been sitting around there for years. You know, three-on-three uh, -three basketball has been played probably as long as basketball has been played. Um, but it's never been elevated to the professional level. And why? You know, what's the reason? It's, it's faster. Um, it's not all that, all that damn running. <laughs> so you can really see guys use their skills. There's nowhere to hide, so you have to play deep. You know, uh, so it's always been something that's been looked at as a you know, a uh, backyard sport or something you do on the playground, but nothing you would ever do in a major arena. And we just wanted to change that. We think it's a great game. It's a great game to watch, fun to play. And with our new wrinkles, um, to me, it's an excellent sport. Uh, so that's why we stepped out this year and said we're, we're actually not even playing three on three. It's fireball three. You know, how, how we got it set up, is to me the perfect uh, calibration of the game. So it's been fun to, and hard, you know, it's not, it's not all fun. It's not all roses trying to, you know, introduce a new sport and make sure it's, it's respected, uh, make sure the athletes are giving their all and that is something that the competition is a high level. So, you know, it's been a, a uphill climb. You know, we're still pushing that ball uphill that boulder so to speak and so um it's just been you know fighting to let people know how great this sport is and i think we've done a pretty good job when it comes to awareness i love the idea of the reality show i know as uh a fan of of ufc and mma i first got into it because of ultimate fighter and the way they were able to promote everyone in that house and build the product this one's a little different, though, because you, got, you have guys who are playing in the big three who played in the NBA, who made millions of dollars. How are you going to get all of them to buy in to live in a house with each other? Has there been any pushback on that? No, that's been – you know, we haven't reached out to one player yet, but all of them has, have reached out to us. All of them want to be in the house. All of them want to go for, you know, for a million dollars, you know, to make a million dollars in three weeks playing basketball. You know, them dudes, that's like right up their alley. So right. uh, we've been having guys call us, but we don't have all the details. So we haven't been, you know, signing guys up yet until we get all the details on, you know, where it's going to be, how long they're going to be there, uh, and what's going to be the restrictions and, you know, how is it just going to play out. So until we have more answers, then we can reach out not only to our athletes, not only to big three players, but it might be some other players out there that want to get down. 
So, you know, I heard some retired players might want to get into this. So, you know, we're doing whatever we can to, to make sure we got something cool. And to have the big brother concept mixed with basketball, you know, they're not just going outside playing crazy games on the, on the lawn, but they're actually, you know, it's actually real certified big three games to advance. So to me, it's a great concept at a time like this. So I, I, this question is more of a like full career question, but I'm always curious on this with <laughs> creative minds and, and you have an unbelievably creative mind. You've done so many different things, you know, rapping and then music and then, and then uh, obviously movies and producing and acting and now doing this with the big three. Is there a moment that you can pick out where you are like, I need a new uh, something. I need a new uh, mountain to climb. And that's why I'm going to transition. Or was it natural? Like maybe that's a terrible way of asking it, but I'm always curious. Was there a mm -hmm. moment where you're like, I'm kind of over the music stuff. I need a new challenge. Let's try this. No, I mean, creatively, I'm always looking to, to be creative innovative, uh, unique, first to the punch. You know, I'm always looking to do those things, but that doesn't fuel me, you know. It's, it's got to be something that I see deep inside, you know. I can never be tired of music. I can never get tired of movies. Uh, but the sports world, this is something that, that I wanted to see that didn't exist. So I'm like, why not us? You know, why not – us put it on since we want to see it it don't exist and i think it's a lot of people out there like me who want to see something cool like this so that's really where it came from a desire um to see something that didn't exist uh on the level that i had pictured it um so that's kind of where it came from but me and my partner jeff kwan we worked on the concept for over a year um with rules, uh, business uh, model, uh, really, you know, arguing about, you know, how things should play out, uh, coming up with innovative uh, wrinkles to the game, which we think are important to make sure that our game is fast paced. Um, it's faster than the NBA. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we feel um, you know, we did to, to create this. So it wasn't really a whim. It was more like, you know, if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. You've been so successful at so many things and you have a diverse set of portfolio in your businesses, but your talents are also diverse. I mean, from music to producing, you discovered Chris Tucker. Uh, you did a movie with Jennifer Anaconda. She's a huge fan of you. So is Benny. I mean, you've got big, big supporters. Uh, in our family, all of us love your work and are big supporters of you and your family. But my question is, when it comes to producing, acting, music, uh, business, can you let me know maybe one or two or three people that you looked up to that inspired Cube growing up as a young lad? I mean, I looked up to uh, Easy e um, you know, rest in peace. He's a guy who who came out the neighborhood, who was hustling, making money you know he's making pl plenty of, of money in the game but he wanted to be legal he he wanted to stop looking over his shoulder and he used that same energy that he put into hustling into something uh that was more positive like making music and making a label so he inspired me a lot uh people like uh russell simmons i mean this is a man who you know, had a vision of taking hip hop from the streets to the highest of high in the music business, not just to do a record, but to take them to where, um, you know, Michael Jackson, uh, Beatles, Elvis, you know, all these, you know, stars had reached. He wanted to take rap to those heights. So very inspirational to me um, and my father. You know, my father put the work ethic in me. Uh, seeing him get up and uh, go to work, you know, um, he would do his thing and hang out and have fun, but he would still be ready to go to work the next morning. And, and um, I saw him get up early in the morning, and I saw him work two jobs sometimes. Um, 
I saw when he was, you know, when his when his uh, company went on strike that he worked for, him taking up jobs in the neighborhood um, and doing whatever it takes to provide. And so these are my inspirations coming up, man. How hard was it to leave NWA early in your career? Uh, and did you have any regrets at any moment? Because I think it's a really great business lesson of a young creative mind standing up for themselves. And that doesn't happen all the time. It's a really hard thing to do to be like, you know what? Things aren't right. I'm going to stand up for myself. I'm going to fight for myself. Was that difficult? And there, was there that, those moments where you're like, man, I made a mistake here. I could have done the easy thing and just played along and probably gotten taken advantage of but it would have been at least the easier path. I never wanted to leave. Um, you know, I was fighting that, but I felt like I was, the more I questioned, the more I was getting ostracized. So I didn't like that feeling of, of some, some people like acting like they don't want you around. You know, I'm quick to, if you don't want me around, I'm out. You know, no problem. Just let me know. So I didn't, once I made up my mind, I was fine with it. But I had some strong people in my corner that I couldn't put in the movie that was helping me, like Pat Charbonnet. Pat Charbonnet, if you watch Friday, you'll see her on the credits. Big inspiration to me. Um, just taught me a lot of the game. She had worked for Priority Records before being my manager, so... She knew about Jerry Heller. She knew about these people. Her, uh, another lawyer out of San Francisco by the name of Michael Ashburn. He's the one who, who uh, told me, yo, don't sign nothing. Make sure you don't sign nothing. You know, um, be firm in that and get the paperwork and let us look at it first. So, you know, in the movie, it looked like I was just walking in there, you know, and I knew everything that that what was going on, but I had help. I had people in my corner, thank God, to help me make that decision. But once I made up my mind, I didn't look back and had no plans or regrets at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love the story just being, you just hear it all the time when it comes to young creative people being in spots where they might not be, you know, making the money off of, you're the talent, you're the guy who's doing it, you're the, you're the straw that stirs the drink, and not being compensated fairly, you see that story all the time in business. So I always have tremendous respect for anyone who can stand up for themselves and be like, hey, this isn't right. Let's make this right. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the time, a lot of people were telling me that I was crazy to leave a group like NWA. Um, groups like that just didn't come around, you know, once, twice in a generation. So, but... Where I'm from, as soon as you know you ain't wanted, you don't want to be wanted. You know what I mean? As soon as I know y'all don't want me, I don't want y'all to want me. Mm -hmm. I'm done. I'm gone. You know, you can't beg me to come back. So um, it was just, you know, I think, you know, my upbringing plus standing on principle. You know, I was broke before we started making records. So going back to being broke wasn't scary to me. Uh, so I was like, I'd rather have my dignity you know, leave with my manhood and leave intact spiritually than to uh, be broken down because I was, you know, so uh, addicted to the fame or the money or the group or the whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I love I love going back to the foundation because, uh, you know, I, I came up uh, right down here in Miami, um, single mother who had two jobs. My father left us when he was 10. Um, so different background, but, but a lot of similarities, especially just being a Hispanic minority, someone that was an underdog. My question to you is what fears the cube have at the age of 12 to 15 and what fears do you have today? Uh, 12 to 15, my fears was getting murdered, you know, just getting shot. Mm. Um, that was my biggest fear. Somebody, sh you know, just killing me and me not being able to enjoy this life that I, that I love so much, you know, life is so precious. And so that was, that was my biggest fear, you know, um, and just maneuvering, you know, making sure that, that I, I kept my options open and 
I mean, I knew the options that the hood had, and those were always there. But I was like, okay, these are, these are in the bag. What can I do outside of what, what I see everybody else doing? And it was hip hop, it was music. Uh, thank God, Sir Jinx, um, who's Dr. Dre's cousin, um, we, we started in a, in a group together. First it was called the Stereo Crew, then we called it CIA to be, mm. you know, to be honest, it was CIA, but, but, <laughs> but me and him, he, he was the only one in my neighborhood doing hip hop at the time, or on my block. So we became good friends, and my other friends was wondering why was I hanging out with the, with the dude that was always carrying cardboard and was, you know, break dancing, you know, flipping and spinning, had rate, you know, he had everything, graffiti, he did it all. And uh, I just wanted to do something new. And so got into hip hop and my whole world opened up because now I was doing something that was underground at the time and not too many people was doing. And it was keeping me out the streets. Um, so to me, it was a win-win. I'm always curious about uh, career transitions and the evolution of uh, creative mind. So has there ever been pushback? You go from NWA, fuck the police, you have your own uh, solo career, and then 20 years later, you're doing family-friendly movies. Have you ever had, a, had that moment where you're like, wait, I'm not the same guy. Now that that's a bad thing, but some of your fans being like, hey, this isn't the same guy. What the hell happened? Have you had that moment? Not, not in that way. You know, I understand people, some people don't like change. They want you to be the same way every day. And they don't mm -hmm. want you to evolve. You know, I started doing music when I was 15 years old. Professionally, about 16, 17. So I've been in the game a long time, you know. It was, it was I, I had a long way to grow. But what I was doing and what to me was important was that America didn't judge a book by its cover or the world. You know, I was all about, let's do what more. Let's do what they don't expect us to do. Let's show that given a chance, you could take somebody out the hood who's hardened by the world of the neighborhood and they can also be a productive, cool citizen in society. They don't have to be, you know, a criminal or gangbanger. They can actually prosper, given a chance. So I wanted to show that flip. I wanted to show all the gangsters out there, look, you can, it is a better life. And it is a way to, to change, you know, what are you really looking for in life? And it's usually the necessities of life. And once you get them, there's no reason to be like that no more. It's a reason to, to, to be right and do the right thing. So hopefully I'm an example. You know, I know people, you know, got like, yo, he went from here to here, but I'm going to make another evolve that y'all probably ain't going to be looking for. You know, I plan to keep evolving all the way till I'm out of here. So, you know, I don't mind it. I love that because it is that push and pull if you're in the creative world where there's going to be people from day one who are like, why are you, you know, selling out or why are you different? But it's way more fascinating to watch people evolve and try new things and be successful at new things than do the same thing over and over for the rest of time. Yeah. And, you know, people got to understand music, you know, doing music is – is real life, you know, that's, you, you make the records, but that's real life. Movies is a make-believe character, so you shouldn't limit yourself because, you know, you make these certain type of records, but on the movie screen, you can be anything. You know, I could be a cartoon, I could be a damn ghost. I was a ghost in, a, in one of those movies. Uh, you can be anything in a movie. So I didn't want to pigeonhole myself and just play gangster roles because that's what they was trying to do to me early in Hollywood, you know. They gave me Boys in the Hood. It was bringing me Menace to Society. It was bringing me all the gangster movies. And I'm like, nah, I'm ready. I want to be an actor that can do any kind of movie. Now, people see me. They can see me in any kind of role, and it's not shocking. Uh, because that's where you want to be in Hollywood. You don't want to pigeonhole myself.
I love it. I love it. That's, I mean, it's, it's uh, having that like range and ability to do everything. That's, I think that's the, the mark of, of someone who can transcend everything else, which you have done. Um, what's your favorite role that you've played in a movie? Wow. Um, I mean, I love Doughboy. Um, I love where he was coming from. Um, but I love Calvin and Barbershop and Craig and Friday. You know, these are just neighborhood guys, you know what I mean? Neighborhood guys who um, just trying to, man, survive. When it's all said and done, these are neighborhood guys that's just trying to get through the day. And that's, to me, the story of all of us. You know, we all from somewhere just trying to get through the day. And sometimes those are my favorite characters. You know, it's cool to do a triple X every now and then and, you know, deal with explosions and all this stuff and or do a, a you know, a, a, a ride along, you know, where you with a comedic genius like, uh, like Kevin Hart. It, it's it's cool to do those and, and have fun, but you know the down to earth real characters are the ones that I like to play the most. Yeah, probably the ones people relate to the most too. Um, I read that you got your college degree in architectural drawing. Is that true? Could you <laughs> draw me a house? Drafting, man. drafting. Could you draft? Architectural you, drafting. Could you draft uh, me a house? No, you wouldn't want me to draw you a house right Why? now, man. Why? You know? <laughs> Because I, I ain't picked up a pencil like that since about 1988. <laughs> so, you know, my skills, you don't want that. But, so, I, yeah, I went for a year. to, to a, It was a trade school called the Phoenix Institute of Technology. So in, in, um, in 87, I went, I went for a year. From, from the September 87, September 88, I was in Phoenix. And that... And you did that because you thought the music thing wasn't going to work out, even though you were basically on the cusp of having the music thing blow up. Yeah, man, but you got to go back, go back to 1987. Okay. How many West coast artists was it in the industry? Maybe one ice T, <laughs> you know, I'm talking about on the national level. Right. So we didn't know, Plus, our records were dirty. So we thought, you know, back then the dirty records went like Richard, Richard Pryor, Red Fox, Dolomite, and then NWA, you know, uh, all them kind of do Blowfly. So we thought our, you know, I thought this dirty record we had was going to end up in that section and only, you know, see the light of day when, when the kids go to sleep. So... You know, I had to have something to fall back on, man, because at that point, music wasn't nothing but a hobby to me because, uh, you know, I was still living in my mama's house. You know, I didn't, even have a, I didn't even have a car. So it was just a hobby to me. And so, you know, I wasn't sure if it was going to work out and I wasn't going to take no chances. And uh, thank God I went to Phoenix because... Fuck the Police was almost never made because when I first told the rhyme to Dre, he didn't want to do it because he was, he had to go in and out. He was doing some kind of weekends in jail. He would go in for the weekend and come out. So it's like, man, I ain't dealing with these shares. I don't want, I don't want to hear their mouth if you do this song. So I was going to throw the song away. I actually threw it in the trash. And my guy named Phoenix Phil went in the trash, pulled it out, and put it back in my notebook. He just spread it out like, because I balled it up. He just spread it out, he put it back in my notebook. He was like, no, nah, man, you got to keep this one. So when it was time to work on the NWA record, I brought it back out. I had my notebook. I pulled it out. So I wrote this rhyme. Dre don't want to do it. At that time, it was easy in the building. Yellow Ryan, Raymond Prince was there, a few other people, DLC. And when I said the rhyme, Easy was like, hell yeah, we're doing this. We're doing this. So that's kind of how that song really came to fruition. 
I love that. That's an unbelievable story. That's an unbelievable story. Those, those weird things that can, can break your way that can end up being like the difference between something huge and something never happening. Yeah, but I, I don't Without a doubt. Re- remember exactly what context you said something, but it seemed uh, that they, they, you said there's enough money to go around. Um, my question is, you know, if you're sitting in an African-American community, in a Latino community, uh, if you're a minority, if you're David and not Goliath, there's so many people, there's so mm-hmm. many distractions and limitations that the world and society puts on all of us. W- what advice, knowing what you know now as a 50-year-old man, giving back advice to a young Cube, a young a at 15, what should young people be doing today to break through all those uh, prejudices? Well, f- first of all, you got to be strong. Uh, I would... I would uh, you know, I would want Young Cube to probably take more, more youngsters under my wing um, and just teach them the game uh, so they don't run into the pitfalls. You know, the thing is, racism has been here longer than us, and there's people in our lives that's dealt with it. Sometimes it's about talking to them and speaking to them and, and let – and 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 – getting the information from the people who came before you, that teaches you how to sidestep these pitfalls that's out here when it comes to racism. But when you black, Latino, minority in this country, you gotta have thick skin. You gotta know the obstacles are there. Those gotta be part of the the struggle, the push. You gotta do what it takes, because those obstacles, you know, we're gonna try to wish them away. We're gonna try to pray them away, and they're still there. So the thing is, you gotta go around it, over it, under it, or through it. Period. There's no, um, you know, you you cannot be defeated. You have to have that mindset. You gotta have that determination. Um, and then I would say, find your true talent. You know, that's what I did. That's what you did. That's what we all got to do. We all are talented in, in some way, shape, or form. And it's up to you to discover that talent, nurture that talent, and try to perfect that talent. And you never know how far that talent will take you. Chad, I have and a it's question. it's not always – yeah. Yeah, I have a question for both of you. But you talk about passion and determination, and I cannot help – but to think about our friend Michael Jordan and the last dance, I'm curious to know, first you, Cube, and then you, Big Cat, I want to know what you both think. I've been so highly inspired and motivated by this brother because Michael was so good to me when I was a youngster, coming up at the age of 18, being in the major leagues in 18 with Ken Griffey Jr. and all the greats. But it was Michael who took me under his wing, taught me about lifting, about good nutrition, about resting, about competing. Wondering how that resonates with you and, and, and you too, Big Hat. I mean, I love Michael Jordan. Um, you know, he's the kind of hero that you dream of. You know, somebody who does everything in his powers to win. Um, and I thank him for that dedication. Um, I thank his teammates for buying into it, the ones that did, um, and understand, you know, to do anything hard or to do anything that's difficult, it brings a lot of stress. And you have to be able to take that stress. You have to be able to take the times when it's the most difficult and you can't quit or give up at them times because these are the make and break moments. So it seemed like Jordan pushed his team, you know, every day to understand the goal at hand because he knew at the end of the day, no matter what we went through to get to this point, we all going to feel better about ourselves by achieving this goal together. And we can walk through life with our head held high because we went through this fire. So. You know, only warriors, people that's been in the game, people that struggled, you know, and understood defeat and 
and getting back up can understand that mentality, you know. Um, when you're in a foxhole, man, there ain't no time to apologize, man. We apologize, we apologize when we win the war. Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. And I, I, the one part that really stuck out to me when the conversation turned to is MJ not a nice guy? Is he a bad teammate? The part when he said, I never asked anyone to do something I didn't do myself. That one is to me what true leadership is. And I like in my world, I pride myself on working as hard as possible all the time, knowing that someday I'm going to ask someone else to do something for me. And if I'm not working hard, they can be like, well, why the hell would I do that? You don't work hard. Why would I work hard? So setting that tone from a level of I'm going to bust my ass. And at some point I'm going to ask you to bust your ass. And when I do, we'll do it together and we'll win together. I think that was the inspiring part of, you know, his, his relationship with his teammates and that struggle and that foxhole that the cube was just talking about. Mm. You know, it's a thing like this, man. Um, you know, I'm very hard on my crew. Okay, mm. everybody that worked for me know that I want you to be a pro. I don't want you to be an amateur because I can't be an amateur. You know, I got to be a pro every time I'm in front of the camera, the mic, or whatever I do. So I expect my team to work as pros and no amateur shit can get in here because we've been in the game too long. So I hold them to a standard. You know, that don't mean I'm yelling all day, but I am checking the standard. And if you slipping, I'm gonna let you know. I'm gonna let you know in whatever way I believe is gonna be the most effective. Sometimes it's pulling you to, a, to the side. Sometimes it's mentioning it in front of everybody so everybody didn't know they got it. Sharpen their tools too. You know, every pencil needs to be sharpened at some time. Uh, that, that's a good point too, because it's, it's setting the standard. And like MJ said, the championship standard, like this is what we're playing for. And if it's business world, it's the same thing. And, you know, I'm in the podcast world. Like this is what the standard is. And when we slip below the standard, there's issues. And having that set standard of this is where we're at. This is where the bar is. And having everyone buy into like this is the bar we have to jump over. That's everything. Because otherwise, people can say, "Well, I didn't know, and I didn't. It, it wasn't clear to me." I, yeah, I burnt out homes. I mean, I burnt them out where they like, "Man, you work too hard. I, I can't do this." All of them want. Let me go on tour with you. Let me go on tour. Come on, come on. You want to go on tour? You want to see this work? Real work when you're on tour. Come on, man. They ready to go home because. It's work. It ain't, it, ain't, it ain't as much fun as they thought it was going to be. And I have no problem with sending their ass home. Bye. You know, you go home, you know, because I only want people out here that's dedicated to, to the overall goal, which is keep this, keep this uh, train running on time. We're going to get back to Ice Cube in a second, but I want to talk to you guys really quickly about my friends at Cross Country Mortgage. I used to work in the real estate business. When you hear the word mortgage, you probably say to yourself, I am not ready to buy a home. I am not ready. I can't qualify. Well, guess what? That is wrong because we have our friends at Cross Country Mortgage that are here to help you figure out the best way that you can start uh, the home buying process and start building some equity in your home. Don't st don't throw money away every single month with rent. You're literally throwing it away. Cross Country Mortgage, they can figure out a way to help you build that wealth, build that wealth with your home because Cross Country Mortgage combines a people first mindset with a dedication to fundamentals of mortgage lending, with re which results in a fast, easy and stress free home financing experience, a personalized approach of assessing individual needs to recommend the best loan option for each customer has allowed Cross Country Mortgage to serve their com communities and forge lifelong relationships since 2003. Uh, although they've grown up into a nationwide lender over the years, Cross Country Mortgage's focus on maintaining the mom and pop spirit continues to separate them from the competition. I can speak to that. I actually got on a phone call with a bunch of uh, my friends at Cross Country Mortgage. They are ready to talk to anyone, and they're ready to talk to you because you are probably sitting there saying, I can't own a home, but yes, you can. And Cross Country Mortgage will do that for you because you can log on right now online, CCM. 
lens.com slash corp and find out what home loan is good for you. They make it easier for more people to get financing. They need to own a place of their own, especially first time home buyers. If you're a military vet and people with less than, less than stellar credit, cross country mortgage is going to help you out licensed in all 50 States. And they deliver fast closings with a highly efficient process. Cross Country Mortgage also is looking out for you because they make sure to put their customers first by providing the tools and the resources for loan officers to succeed with their own offices. Their loan officers know their businesses and markets best, and this entrepreneurial approach helps everyone win. You're not going to just get a name and a phone number. You're going to get someone personalized who can help you in your market. So go to CCM lens.com slash corp to learn more about your future home buying experience that's ccmlends.com slash corp to learn more cross country mortgage llc nmls 3029 equal housing opportunity go to crosscountrymortgage.com for licensing and disclosures okay let's get back to more ice cube i i know i have one last question i think erod's got some last questions as well but my last question was you see a million different pitches. You see a million different businesses every day, every year, where people have an idea and they want you to be involved. What sets each one apart? What's the one where you're like, that's a great idea? Is it the people? Is it the idea? How do you judge where you're going to put your time and energy into when it, when it, when it comes into going forward? Um, of course, you want to check out the people you, you, and, you know, you're dealing with. You know, the people have to be good people. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's really about my passion. How passionate? Will I give 110%? Because if I don't feel like I'm going to give 110%, I don't want to be involved. So I'm very passionate about what I do. And if I can't give it my all or if I feel like this don't deserve my all, I always say it's better for me not to be a part of it because – you're not going to get what you think you're going to get. So, you know, I'm, I'm either a thousand percent in or I'm a thousand percent out. So Cube, I got one. I got to go back to my heritage, which is baseball. You know, it's what I love. Uh, I spent the yeah. last almost 30 years kind of doing that uh, either at the big league level or broadcasting and just, you know, it's, it's what I love. I know. And that's <laughs> my it, you know, you're one of the coolest cats alive. My question to you is, if you were commissioner for one day, what kind of things would you do to bring back the, the urban America to baseball, the youth, excitement, entertainment, uh, and create that kind of, uh, you know, cool factor that you have with the big three? W what are some of the things you would do for baseball? I mean, I would, I would heavily invest into our parks and recreation when it comes to Little League Baseball in the inner city. Um, mm. When I was growing up, uh, it was everywhere. You know, all my friends played baseball. You know, I was a football, basketball guy. But all my friends played baseball. I used to love to go watch them play right up at Holly Park. And, you know, through the 80s, it just dwindled to nothing. Um, and so I just think that's – that. You know, we need to get that back. You know, we need to, to really focus on inner city, inner city little leagues, baseball, and, uh, and making it affordable for the, for the parents because, you know, you got to buy equipment here and there. But just, you know, you, you got to do things to, to, to give it a bump, you know, because baseball is Whoa, a hold up, hold up, hold up. I told you you had fans Check in the house. Oh, man. <laughs> man. You know, I heard, I heard it was a couple snakes down in uh, Brazil that need to be taken care of. You want to go right there? <laughs> you want to go down there and grab a I couple I never want to go back there. <laughs> what year was that, man? No, we had the best time. We had a, 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 actually an amazing summer. An amazing summer. We yes. got to know each other real well. And now it's Brazil. <laughs> Didn't the fake snake almost kill someone? Both of us, but we both got out. Almost, yeah. Man, that snake, we were so terrified of that thing because it would malfunction. It tore up the set one time, so we was like, man, this snake going to kill us for real. So, so, and <laughs> Amazon don't, the snake will. Give Cube one good question for Cube. What do you have? What do you want to know? Mm. I, know, I, know about, I know everything about Cube. <laughs> this man is amazing. 
congratulations on the big three on everything that you've done. Thank you. I mean, I think right when we were when we were doing Anaconda, he was writing, I think Friday at the time, right? That summer? Yes. Yes. He was writing I was doing a lot out. of writing. What are you writing all yeah. the time? He's like, I'm writing a movie. Man. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was uh bit by the bug. Uh it was so cool. I remember us just amazed. We like, look, you know, you got black and brown at the end of this movie, and we don't die. We, we were kill not killed snakes, first. So we knew, <laughs> yeah, we knew this is a new day, and we and, and we had a special moment because we get a chance to kill the snake. So that was incredible <laughs> and uh amazing movie. You're an amazing person. Y'all make an amazing couple. So thank you. Yeah. It is so good Keep to see you. Keep doing it. You I too. So good you to too. See you. I hope I get to see you soon when all this is over and we can get together and do something again. For sure. I'm with that. I'm thank with you, that. Baby. It's so good to see you. Send my love to Kim and everybody. Take it easy. We'll do. We'll do. Uh, well, Ice Cube, this has been awesome. And Ara, do you have your quick questions? Do you have those, the rapid fire yeah, questions? I can, do a little, I can do a little rapid fire to yeah, close. Yeah, do a couple of them. Let's finish with that. So, yeah. So, Cube, I got about seven or eight just quick ones. Yeah. Uh, what songs do you sing to yourself in the shower? Damn, in the shower? Wow. Uh, man, I mean, I got a nice array of different songs, but it's probably something from the Isley Brothers. You know, okay. That's probably something okay. from the Isley Brothers, man. But, but you know, I'm, it, it, sometimes things pop in my head. Ohio players might pop in my head. You know, I'm old school with it. I love it. What, what apps are open? Uh, one app that's open in your iPhone right now? Uh, Instagram. You know, everybody on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> everybody on give me one, one good book that you like, that you recommend, that meant something to you. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> Nothing like uh, uh, I would I would go with message to the black man. Okay. Man. Co are you a coffee tea? Coffee or tea? I'm a coffee guy. All right, so coffee man, I got to have my mud. Got to have my mud. If you have one last meal, what would that meal be? Uh, probably be a steak. Okay. Steak, uh, macaroni and cheese. Ooh, I'm with you. Um, you know, I would probably throw, uh, man, lobster. It's my last meal, man. Got to have it with lobster. And what's a <laughs> cocktail to wash it down? <laughs> oh, man, you know, give me a, give me a little, you know, Henny and Coke or, or, you know, I'll take a Jack and Coke. You know, I'm a simple man. Right. I love it. So these are just five quick ones. One word to describe these people. Dr. Dre. Meticulous genius. Well, meticulous. Put it down. David Bowie. Uh, galactic. Tupac. Tupac. Spirit. J-Lo. Amazing. Your wife. My wife, Kim. Oh, man, I got a few words for her. But <laughs> one, wonderful. Wonderful. Awesome. You passed the test. Kat, you can close it. You passed baby. the test. Yeah, yeah. Thank you uh, so much, Q. We really appreciate it. Everyone, check out the big three. We're waiting for it to come back. So we'll be uh, excited as soon as it does come back. We're excited about the reality show. It's going to be great. And uh, thank you so much for your time, man. I mean, thanks for having me, man. Uh, appreciate it. It was fun. Keep doing what y'all doing. Love Barstool. Hey, A Rod, you the man. Big fan forever. Thank Can't you. wait to God see. Bless. All right. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate Thanks, it. That was man. awesome. Right. Thanks so much.